the topic of the first session today is about industry collaboration. And we're going to be looking at how funds in this room can draw on the history of collaboration to create a better Australia, whether that's through partnerships with government or corporate Australia. So who better to do this than, of course, one of the architects of the super industry, a man who's got a vision of how the super industry should look into the future, Gary Weaven. Uh, as many of you know, Gary is the founding executive chair of Industry Fund Services, and he now chairs IFM Investors. Please put your hands together for Gary Weaven. Uh, thank you, Dale. Good morning, everyone. Um, <clears throat> Where uh, the idea is that we make fairly uh, concise opening statements and then have some uh, interview and uh, question and answer. So I'll need to get right into it. Uh, and the first thing uh, is to draw to your attention is this chart, which actually shows that um, whereas today <clears throat> the total assets in the superannuation uh, industry are approximately twice the size of our GDP. By the end of the next decade, it's uh, anticipated uh, that that will grow to something like three times uh, the then GDP. Now, it's clearly been the case so it's 30, over 35 years. Some of you can remember all of that. Uh, 35 years of history of the of really the uh, certainly of the industry fund movement. We've hardly had a year go by without there hasn't been some attack in one form or another. Uh, from the coalition, either in government or in opposition. I don't intend to canvas all of that uh, at all here today, even if I had time, because I want to turn to uh, the idea that, it, that, that maybe uh, the darkest hour comes before the dawn, and maybe there is an inflection point available to us now, and maybe the world could look a bit different, uh, and this could be, there could be the emergence of an opportunity for all of that conflict and opposition to finally turn to collaboration to at least some degree between <coughs> the business community, the, um, the superannuation sector uh, and, uh, and governments, both state and federal governments. That is uh, what I think the opportunity now that sits before us. And you can see, you'd think really that the business community and governments of any persuasion would be totally mad looking at those numbers to not pursue such a uh, state of affairs. Um, so I want to just deal with a few of um, the potential areas where I think um, uh, that scenario could actually bear fruit for the, for the people of this nation. And uh, these are the, the five areas that I will very briefly um, put forward, I could expand on, the, on, that, on those areas. The first is, is received a little bit of press, uh, thanks largely to uh, intervention by, by Paul Keating and others. Um, in fact, IFM, actually, IFM Investors actually has been, for 19 years, has been um, addressing in a fairly limited way this, this, this market of um, corporate debt Australian, for Australian companies through our uh, special credits fund. It used to be called Alternative Fixed Income Fund. Uh, because it was alternative, it's less alternative now, I guess. Um, but generally speaking, the field has been left uh, to, the, to the big banks with their very large um, credit assessment teams. But now, when you look at it, the, the, the changing regulatory environment post-GFC uh, and a number of other changes globally <coughs> are restricting the degree to which banks uh, will, be, will be able to use their balance sheet to fully service that sector. The banks are going to focus a lot more on um, their either lower risk or higher profit um, margin areas, uh, like their transaction banking, like um, residential lending and, and, and the like. And they're going to need to spread their balance sheet um, uh, more effectively. So I think that really is going to present a, a great opportunity for a big expansion in the number of opportunities for this sector, for our sector, to uh, step in possibly in partnership with those banks, as strange as that might sound today, but possibly in partnership with, with the banks to, um, to achieve that. So something like 95 billion per annum currently is lent to non-financial corporations from the banking sector each year. So 95 billion, that is you know, potentially very, very big business indeed um, that can be addressed. 
in part by us. Secondly, uh, on infrastructure, well, almost everyone agrees that we, we, could be, we could spend hundreds of billions over the next decade on uh, profitably spend in terms of social and economic terms uh, and environmental terms uh, over the next decade, hundreds of billions, if we could all get our act together, if we could get the correct political leadership and the correct frameworks in place. Um, it's certain that some of our, trading our biggest trading partner certainly has been doing that for many, many years. It's you know, built like 90 airports while we've been talking about a second airport for Sydney in that period. Um, so there is an opportunity, there's a great opportunity to do something. But are we going to spend all of our time instead in a, in a political debate about private versus public ownership and all of those issues and, 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 and uh, the level of taxation needed to support the, ne the level of debt and all of those questions? So I've been arguing fa fairly quietly for me, actually, I've been arguing for many years now that there is, would be a better way. Um, to approach this. I think a, a much better way would be, would be a partnership approach between governments uh, and, and the superannuation sector, obviously requiring some pre-approved sort of manager, where essentially a bargain would occur in a very transparent way around a target rate of return, a target IRR for a particular project, and with all of the risks and, uh, and uh, allocated between the parties. And in an, in an arrangement where there might be some flaw uh, under, the, under the, the returns, but there would certainly be a ceiling above which the taxpayers would, would share in any outperformance. But critically, a system where the manager itself could not make windfall profits from the transaction. The manager would be confined to a fixed management team for the life of the asset, and that would be the only way they could earn income. Uh, there would be no related parties in refinancing, no related parties in consulting or any other area. Uh, and importantly, the deal, once negotiated, would be offered to every single registered superannuation fund in Australia. And every fund would have an equal opportunity to participate. And if, if it was attractive and was oversubscribed, every fund would be scaled back in proportion to either their their, the size of their fund or the number of members or some formula such as that. In that way, uh, the, if there is outperformance, then everyone shares, really the whole community would, would be sharing in it. Um, so uh, windfall returns, as I say, would be widely shared. But Australian ownership would be maximised under that model and the market would be cleared. It would also be more efficient in terms of dealing with the banking community in the raising of debt, uh, because as you are no doubt well aware, the biggest part of almost all of infrastructure assets and, and projects is actually bank finance, uh, not equity. Uh, the third area, residential property, affordable housing, social housing. I know Tim will have some more to say about this, so I'm not going to, um, I'm not going to uh, say anything now, but there might be a, a, a chance later. Uh, but just to say this, the very first investment ever made by IFM investors' predecessor, Development Australia Fund, was in fact in a New South Wales government rent buy scheme to assist people to get into affordable housing. And since that time, that was back in the early 90s, since that time there's been thousands and thousands of seminars, mainly sponsored by governments, and homelessness has got worse, affordability's got worse. Uh, so it is time that something uh, is actually done about that issue. Um, some of you will have noticed from time to time some of the rural politicians and segments of the, of the coalition squawking about agriculture in one way or another. <clears throat> Barnaby, for example, lamenting the fact that superannuation funds weren't investing more in agriculture and wondering why that was the case. Well, I can, I can tell him it's very simple. The returns are no good. So <laughs> the returns traditionally, uh, some people have made money, of course, but the returns as a sector are very poor and the volatility is quite substantial, the commodity prices and drought and all the other things that go with it. So the fact of the matter is that the reason that often large offshore institutional investors are able to come in and invest in a significant way is because they can participate in the margins of the downstream processing or distribution 
of that agricultural horticultural output in the destination markets, whether that's China, whether it be Canada, wherever it is. So they can take their, their, their margin in those downstream areas. So if a government wants to do something useful in the area, it should be using its trade and, and, and foreign affairs diplomacy to try and broker deals whereby the, the super sector, for example, could partner with some of those organisations in not simply farms and agriculture in Australia, but in the, in the total process. Uh, so that there would be a sharing and so that the average returns uh, of, that, of those sort of partnerships would be quite acceptable and in fact attractive uh, to investors. Um, so uh, the fifth thing I'll just quickly start, talk about is industry policy generally. Um, I, th I think a, a really bold vision um, would include ways for governments to collaborate with the super industry uh, in, in the development of proactive industry policy. One, oh, I won't go into it now because time doesn't permit, but uh, in, in questions it might. Um, the coming boom in electric cars, it's a certainty. It is a virtual certainty. Electric cars will displace very soon petrol driven and diesel driven cars. We have no position in that industry whatsoever in spite of having given billions to multinational car companies over many decades. We have no position in the future industry whatsoever. Uh, similarly with energy policy, it is a virtual certainty when you look at the cost curves for solar, for wind and for battery storage, you look at the cost curves, you look at the technological advancement, it is an absolute certainty that they will displace fossil fuel generation to a very great degree and both, both in terms of lower cost and lower emissions, of course much lower emissions, uh, and they will do so even without any further financial incentives. There's existing scheme running off right now, even without uh, new financial incentives. That will happen. Of course, the timing can be tricky and, and that can be a problem for investors. But all we really need, I'm not saying us, all anyone really needs is a stable policy environment. All of these projects need 30 year plus time horizons to have a payoff. If you can't guarantee even one year of an electoral cycle certainty, then it becomes extremely difficult. So it's relatively easy to fix with adult, adult collaboration rather than student politics. So on that issue, as with so many other issues affecting super, the opportunity may finally be arriving to emerge from an electoral cycle with a chance to build a long-term social partnership between uh, governments uh, and a super superannuation industry squarely focused on members' best long-term interests. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Gary. Now, one of the areas that he touched on was, of course, collaboration in particularly social housing sector. And for a perspective on that, we've got one of the most passionate advocates of social justice issues, Tim Costello. Tim is one of Australia's most respected community leaders, a sought after voice on social justice issues, leadership and ethics. He's going to provide some insights on how a potential collaboration uh, between the sectors would work and any challenges that could face that collaboration. Please put your hands together for Tim Costello. Well, thank you for that introduction. It's pretty much as I wrote it, really. Uh, I want to uh, just start with the question of collaboration. And uh, is it possible that the Royal Commission has been a watershed, a clearinghouse of some of the ideological nonsense that might clear the field for some genuine collaboration. We are all aware of what's been going on and yet industry super has come through uh, glowingly, flying colours, and uh, I think hopefully that means that there is now a level of trust for collaboration. What we know around Australia, it's actually true around the world, is the trust deficit is much greater than any budget deficit. When people feel institutions are failing them and institutions are only looking after themselves, 
collaboration starts to evaporate. People are turning institutions, are just watching their own brand and back. So that would be a, a great outcome. We know if collaboration is possible, Gary's gone to this, Paul Keating was going to it in the Finn Review yesterday, then uh, super with long-term investment, uh, 15, 20, 30 years, with that sort of collabor collaborative adult conversation, as Gary put it, gives us a real opportunity. The um, asset owners and uh, government and um, corporate sector is our title. I'd also like to add in not-for-profits, NGOs. There is this sense that somehow we have said government regulates, state governments deliver services, business makes profit and uh, not-for-profits do the hands and feet service delivery and they care. That paradigm is gone. We actually have to find a way in which at each level, both policy setting help coming from not-for-profits, not just from governments, uh, as a leader of civil society at G20s, going to many of them over the years, you know, tax havens and uh, the hemorrhaging of wealth, all governments being broke, wasn't on the agenda till civil society marched in London saying, why doesn't Microsoft, Starbucks, Facebook pay their taxes? Until then, G20 said, all of that corruption's third world development nations. It's not us. When so many people marched, first Gordon Brown, then David Cameron said, oh, absolutely, we're hemorrhaging here. We have to deal with this. Civil society is incredibly important for also putting a spotlight on policy and having a role to play. So the division really of who is responsible is a question we have to answer. It is government, it is asset owners, it is corporates, and it is also NGOs in the value systems. Of course, the world has a world vision. I work for World Vision, so there's a brand plug. But the world vision is called the Sustainable Development Goals. And why we need a global world vision is all our problems can only be solved globally. The world is a waterbed. You press down in one place, it comes up in another place. Think climate change. Think 65 million displaced people and refugees. Think world trade, free trade, and a rules-based system. And what we're seeing is a turning inwards. A nationalist, populist, authoritarian undermining of the Sustainable Development Goals. If you look at those, you'll see it's a good plan. Regrettably, it's hard to memorise 17 goals. The MDGs were just seven, and you could punch through, and we had extraordinary focus with the Millennium Development Goals. But this is certainly inclusive. It marks Australia's homework. For the first time in the SDGs, first world nations have to say what they're doing about poverty, sustainable cities, climate change, what we're doing about water, what we're doing in all of these areas. And 17 is partnerships. Really, the theme of what we're on about, or this session's on about today, collaboration and partnership and who is responsible. Well, we are seeing some movement around climate change. There's a fund member at rest who's suing the fund for not proper risk assessment of climate change. We know that partnership has to include philanthropy. It needs social outcomes funds that are long-term and preventative of child abuse, of kids out of home, of homelessness. 15, 20-year preventative programs rather than what is government spending, which is always crisis-driven. In prisons, the spending rate is going up much higher than, faster than in schools. This is madness when you think that it's just crisis-driven rather than long-term thinking. The uh, in responsible investment spectrum. Well, 
on that spectrum, you'll see, and I can't quite read it, but there's a traditional investment. And in some ways, the Royal Commission has been just about that. Are you fulfilling your fiduciary duties and are you looking after members? And that's a, been a pretty damning indictment on the retail sector, not industry sector. There's ESG, there's negative screening. Uh, negative screening uh, at the moment, uh, and I'll put this on the agenda, doesn't include uh, gambling. I regard Australia's $25 billion losses, the greatest per capita in the world. Our losses are $1,000 per head. The nation that comes second is $600 per head. We're not only the greatest gambling losers in the world, we're losers by 40% more than the second nation. That 25 billion lost, if it was going into JB Hi-Fi and other businesses, is a lot of spending power. I regard this as one of the re most profound regulatory failures. We have 20% of the world's pokies. We have 75% of the world's pokies in pubs and clubs, meaning you can have a drink as you gamble. The rest of the world allows slot machines, but not to drink at the same time. Brilliant idea, Australia. We have well over 400 deaths a year. I do a lot of funerals because when people die of uh, being told you are irresponsible, the gaming industry and government message is gamble responsibly. So it's harder to admit you've got a gambling problem than you've got a mental illness or you've got a drug addiction because you've been irresponsible. It pathologizes the individual. No, the machines are built for addiction. One in three who plays them gets addicted and they're all around. Now, of course, coals are getting out. Eddie Maguire at Collingwood, followed by Geelong, Melbourne, are joining North Melbourne of getting out and saying this is doing so much damage. If Eddie Maguire can get the ethical damage of this shabby, shabby business, Industry super fund managers should too. <laughs> Woolworths, of course, is the biggest supplier of pokies and aren't moving 12,000 pokies, doing profound damage. The Norwegian trillion dollar sovereign fund is divesting. Um, when we think of this regulatory failure, we just have to go, how come? With sports betting now, even after our so-called restrictions, advertising jumped in by 31%. It is just so profitable targeting our kids. Italy's banned all sports betting. Uh, Disney in Florida's fighting gambling and, and, and casinos because of the damage. Well, if we take through a negative gearing then to positive screens, uh, my time's nearly out so I can't take you all through, right to impact investing. I know one industry fund, Christian Super, that I've been doing a bit of work with, is doing some fantastic work on impact investing. And when I look at this work, I realise they're really saying, maybe five years ago, the only expectation was, are we fulfilling our fiduciary duties as trustees and giving people a safe retirement? I now think with 2.7 trillion, five years on, this landscape has shifted. And it's shifted profoundly in areas like how are we addressing social housing? You know, Britain has 20% of its total housing stock in social housing. Australia's is under 5%. Victoria is only 3.2%. And then we wonder why we have homelessness. We go, oh, we can't work it out. Buck passing state and federal governments have led to this uh, tragedy. This is something I'm personally committed to because as mayor of St Kilda, I'm the last mayor ever of St Kilda. I did such a good job they abolished the whole council, but something to do with council amalgamations, but we got up social housing, the first council in Australia. 15% of St Kilda housing stock is social housing. Ratepayers' dollars going into it. This is where asset owners, with corporates, with governments, with not-for-profits, actually have a role for a big vision, a vision that the nation is crying out for. They want to trust. They want to believe in something.
And we really only trust when we actually feel we belong. We have a stake. That's when we care, when we are acting ethically. You have a role to play in that sense of belonging and restoration of trust. Thank you. Okay, now I'm going to open it up to the audience for questions. So, as I mentioned earlier, you can use the conference app. The uh, AXA Investment Managers Live Q&A is now open. So, we'll be taking as many of your questions as possible. Um, there appears to be some consensus amongst the both of you about potential collaboration. Gary, of course, uh, the industry has a lot of money to give. Tim, you say, brilliant. We've got a lot of social causes that, that need those funds. And, and while I think it's, it's obviously great to be able to collaborate, my question is, at the front and centre are member outcomes. So how does a super fund invest in something like social housing? Where is the return on investment for members? Is, is that even possible? How does that work? Yeah, well, we, obviously, um, we, we are not going to advocate anything that doesn't get a, a great return for, yeah. for our for fund, super, super fund members. That's, that's our trade, you know, is to, is, that's our, our hallmark. Mm -hmm. um, but if, if you look at it, first of all, the, the gap is not huge. It's about how you use government intervention um, to leverage, best leverage that government, that taxpayer support. I mean, the taxpayers have to pick up the bill in one way or another, or the society picks up the costs one way or another for all of the problems that go with homelessness. It's about leveraging it. And when the, the, the um, Former Labor government's plan about the national rental mm. subsidy scheme was not far off. Mm. It, was, it was only a whisker short of being institutional investor grade to create a, a big increase in supply. You've got to remember that there's no demand risk at yeah. that end of the spectrum. Yeah. There's, there's always going to be a queue mm. for affordable rental housing or for social housing and so on. There's always a queue. So there's no demand risk. It's just a matter of getting the return, tweaking the return. And, and um, you know, it was very... If, if there had been better cooperation between state, local and federal government, for example, with planning rules, I mean, why, why should we allow land bankers, land bankers to take all the windfall profit out mm. of rezonings? Mm. Why don't state governments channel their planning you know, around railway stations and so on into a portion of social housing and take the windfall profit from rezoning for the public good. For ex just, just one example. Yeah. So it, it does sound like in order to make this happen, you do need the support of governments across the various levels. Here's a question from the audience sort of related to the topic I just asked you. How should a trustee reconcile the sole purpose test with opportunities in social housing? Yeah, well, uh, Tim might like to comment on the, yep. the not-for-profit sector of, of housing provision, you know, and welfare provision. But... From my, where I sit, there is enormous uh, opportunity for superannuation funds to collaborate with that sector to get better use of the great land assets and so on that that, that sector has. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And um, just to make a sort of political comment, I noticed uh, Keating yesterday had a good line, when does he never have a good line, uh, saying you know, our, our Conservative Party here is the strangest in the world. They don't believe in saving and thrift. And he was talking about compulsory superannuation guarantee. But um, Edmund Burke, who conservatives always quote, um, and was terrific in what he said, said, Society is a contract between those in the past, the present, and the unborn. Mm. And it's that social contract that I've been watching. So we're having our first grandchild in um, December. Boy, is my wife happy. I've never seen her so happy <laughs> in my life. I'm happy, but she's ecstatic. Um, our son and his wife uh, are trying to find a two-bedroom flat of our three kids. None young adults, none of them ever expect to own their own home. It's just interesting to see how that shift has happened. They turned up on Saturday to uh, rental after a rental. They said there was 50, 60 individuals, couples. They said it was just unbelievable. So, you know, talk about a biblical image of no room in the inn and, no, and trying to find a manger. Yes. This is already the contract with our kids that we're failing. So, 
the windfall gain from rezoning, the regulatory policy settings are there, but uh, I really don't understand why my kids aren't rioting in the streets when, they, when I feel how our generation has taken the, the goodies and allow governments to get away with that. Well, the, the question I have is, if, if there is so much to gain from a potential collaboration between these two potential industries, what are the impediments? What's stopping? Where are the challenges? Yeah. Is, it, is it lack of government support? Well, what is it? You, you do have to have vision. I mean, and a lot of these things do require a sort of a, a, a central glue in a policy sense. You know, like for example, if you, it is, it would be crazy 20 years ago to invest in clean energy if it's more costly and there's no government framework in place so you can make a return, obviously. So you do need government intervention to pull parties together and come up with creative solutions. On the sole purpose test, what I'd put back to people is this. Sole purpose test requires, you be, it's because super gets tax breaks. That's what it's about, actually. Yeah. So let's get the context. Sole purpose test exists in the legislation so that people can't use superannuation tax breaks to do other things, like make widgets. Mm. So, but the sole purpose test requires to act in the best interests of members. The term of that is going back to your generational integer. Mm. The term of that is not specified, but the member's best interest. What I'd put to, to you is how, how is it that you can act in accordance with the sole purpose test if all you ever do is the traditional things that the fund management industry has always done? How could that conceivably be carrying out your responsibility under the sole purpose test? It's failure. So, you know, inaction and failure to look at things is a bigger cause of inappropriate behaviour by trustees than being too progressive, in my opinion. We've got a couple of really good questions coming in. Uh, one of them says, look, we need a debate about what is the role of government, which we'll get to. But this one from Chris Bryant. Um, how about more Australian renewable energy investments? It's something you touched on briefly. Mm. Is this possible or is the political landscape too crazy? What's the path to success, both of you? Yeah, well, look, I, I personally feel, and Gary made the case that it's going to happen, and I agree with this even without subsidy, uh, but I personally think that this uh, conservative notion of a uh, social contract with the next generation says that this is profoundly important in terms of the future of our planet. My World Vision work, um, the poor are already profoundly impacted by climate change. They're living on the most marginal lands, cyclones, uh, when the rains come instead of just normal rain, droughts are longer. Barnaby, produce an agricultural white paper uh, that didn't really mention drought and didn't connect climate change. There's Fiona Simpson, head of the National Farmers Association, saying climate change is intensifying drought here in Australia. So I think the moral scientific case is very, very clear. But in terms of um, that contract with the young, I think there's a very strong case for proper subsidisation and investment in this because we know this tipping point is rushing on us with the speed yeah. of a train that's not going to stop. And, and I think to that point, one of the questions here is, this is where I think we could really have a debate about what is the role of government, which leads on to another question where the person's asked, is the Labor or Federal Government the only one of the two major parties that could deliver a solution of climate change issues? Absolutely not. I mean, state and, state and federal governments, all, and local government for that matter, all have a role to play. It's not the political um, colour, it's the motivation. Mm -hmm. If your motivation is simply to throw rocks at um, the super industry because it involves unions, well, that's just, that's idiocy. That's mm -hmm. immaturity, it's idiocy. You know, I get it that unions tend to support the Labor Party, I get that, so don't expect the coalition to like them, yeah. right? But if they choose the, one of the, the most important parts of Australian economic life, the super, as their battleground, they're going to get a hiding. And they need to wake up to that. They need to turn, it, turn what we've created in the super to a positive for Australia. If they focus on policy and statesmanship and leading the country, they will find willing partners. And, you know, we need to set these policies. There's 20 million people or something living in the, in the Ganges Delta. Like, the, the smallest amount of sea, sea level change there yeah. wipes all of that land out. Yeah. So, 
you know, I'll be really interested in the stop the boats chant at that point. Yeah. I, I might add it'll be fascinating to see what comes out of Nauru where the Pacific Island Conference is now because it's existential for them. Uh, the, the, the water's rising, lapping at them means the refugees is technically never uh, legally associated with climate change. We're going to see Australia seeing the boats from these places come. So this is a <coughs> profound issue in our region. When we're talking about ethical investments and ethical issues, Michael McQueen is asking, should super funds divest from unethical companies or remain invested, engage, and then try to reduce their ne negative impact on society? It's a great question. So um, on pokies, we much prefer, I'm not a prohibitionist, we much prefer what the product to Productivity Commission reports have said, slow the machines down to $1 spin bets. Still got your distraction time, your recreation time without doing the rapid, fast damage. And aristocrat, Coles want to move to $1 bets. We'd prefer Coles at one level to stay in pokies. When they get rid of them, they just go, they're not retired, these licenses. They just go mm -hmm. to more, mm -hmm. more focused, aggressive players. Mm -hmm. Aristocrat, of course, said, no, 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 we can't change the software to $1 bets. Well, that's nonsense because uh, the Victorian government changed it from $10 to $5 bets and it happened like that. But Aristocrat, which is a 20 billion cap company, the biggest uh, uh, gambling company in the world, has such power uh, that probably only divestment with Woolworths who aren't moving is actually going to get the message through. Um, I, I, I seriously liken this issue as our blind spot. In America, it's guns and we can't believe how mad they are, but when you look at the capture of the NRA on policy, on parties, gambling capture here is very, very paralleled and similar because sensible reform, $1 spin bets always gets defeated. So I guess that that is the interesting question here, right? I mean, is it about boycotting it and just boycotting investment, or mm. is it about using the power of money to invest and potentially influence and change that? What, well, what do you think I, think that, I, th I think they both can have their place. I prefer, I prefer intervention okay. than di to divestment, mm -hmm. but divestment can, has, the, has the advantage of a headline. Yep. It's publicity, mainly. In the end, it's not, not a solution because, it, as I think you're sort of getting towards, what, it, what ends up happening, of course, is that um, you take it to a logical conclusion, then uh, all of those industries are owned by criminals, basically. Mm -hmm. You know, all the institutional money yep. deserts the industries. That, so if they're not regulated out of existence, then they're, 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 they're owned by people with no standards. Yeah. So I think it's, it's, a, it's an advertising banner, yes, but the real answer is, is active intervention, lobbying and change and governance change. Mm -hmm. I think that's the real answer. I thank you to everyone in the audience for submitting their questions. Please do keep them coming and I will get to you in just one moment. If we can get a microphone up there. Uh, before we get to um, him, just a question from a trustee director, Brett. He says, as a trustee director focused on net benefits to members, can I or should I take into account social benefit and more qualitative factors such as impact? Great question. I think the main thing you need to take into account is the time horizon yep. over which you're measuring it. Uh, and you certainly need to think about externalities because the member's best interest is not going to be served if you have a series of great returns leading to a society that is impossible to live in. Hmm. That's not going to be the member's best interest. Yeah. So you just have to be sensible about it. I mean, people use this argument as, as if the onus should be on us to prove why we should behave decently and morally when we put a trustee hat on. Like, yeah. we might, with our own money, do that, and people say, that's a very good thing. Put a trustee hat, no, no, no. You must absolutely expunge all idea of moral behaviour mm. and just think about best interest. Now, some fund managers and others will tell you that um, because, frankly, they're engaged in activities that don't bear scrutiny. Yeah. I think, you know, everyone has to make up their own mind. For me, Can I, it's very can I add in that, that yeah. I, I think... Uh, the idea of a fiduciary relationship, a trustee relationship, needs uh, drilling down. At one level, it is I stand in the place of someone uh, 
who doesn't have the time or doesn't have the skills to act in their best interests. When I do that in a fiduciary way, that person also has moral interests. They have social interests. They actually have a bigger picture. So I, I don't think just the return only maximising to that person is a sufficient understanding of a fiduciary relationship. Great. Great. Okay, to the gentleman in the audience. Hi. Uh, Jared, uh, Jared Noonan from Media Super. Yep. Um, Gary, you, on your early slide, you put up a figure of what seems an incredible number, $6 trillion by 2030. But I was just struck by what Tim Costello said, that he's about to have a, his first grandchild, so that that grandchild will be only 11 years of age when that $6 trillion mark will have been reached. I just lost, I'm sorry, Jerry, I've lost, I'm a, as you know, I'm not great on the hearing, I just lost the last bit of what you were asking there. Uh, well, you mentioned $6 trillion by 2030, mm. and yeah. I was just struck by Tim Costello's reference to his grandson or daughter. For, uh, yeah. Being 11 uh, years old when, when super hit $6 trillion, according yeah. to your forecast. Yeah. So I'm just wondering whether you could both think that one through, that your 11-year-old um, grandchild will be living in a world where there will be a pool of money that will be at least $6 trillion, but in the following decade, and so your, your grandchild will only then be, you know, a, a youngster still, um, what's the impact of, the, of that gargantuan pool of money um, that will take us beyond 10 years into 20 and 30 years as far as the sort of building a better tomorrow um, and the way governments and our industry and corporates can collaborate? Mm -hmm. That's a really fantastic question. So what he's basically said is the data that you put forward, which would basically forecast um, $6 trillion, mm. and he put that in the context of Tim's grandchild who'd be 11 years old by the time it hits $6 trillion. And, and talking about that huge sum of money, and at 11 years old you've still got another, you know, I don't know, 40, 50 years before that person retires. So where, where does that leave that, the net, that next generation when you've got this mm. much money and this mm. pool of money in super, well, which, what do you do mm. with it? How do you, yeah. But, but, but as I said, uh, Jerry, in, the, in, in my opening remarks, um, inevitably a lot of that will be invested offshore, right? So it's not, it's not, a, it's not going to be a problem. See, I, ke I keep saying to people, we don't need, we don't need, as a fund manager or industry, we don't need the government to collaborate on these things. The world is a huge place. As soon as we made that investment in going off, we, we, IFM's now got like eight offices around the world. Most of our clients are institutional investors, offshore, 250 yeah, of them, but, but, offshore. So we don't need it. The point is, it could be good for the country mm. and good for our members. Uh, that's the point of it. And, uh, you know, so a lot of that money will inevitably go offshore, but a lot more can be usefully spent in Australia with good leadership and by that I mean good leadership from everyone, from us, from the business community, which is appallingly led, appallingly led. The BCA is essentially behaves as the same organisation that in the 1980s was taking out full page ads, screaming their heads off, asking for the government of the day to discipline us in the ACTU for our outrageous claim of 3%. They spent mm -hmm. a lot of money along that campaign. They're essentially the same organisation. They behave in the same yeah. way. When are they going to grow up? When are they going to move on and not be the force for the lowest common denominator of the business community? We know most businesses don't support the troglodyte views that come out of that organisation. Yeah. Just quickly on the topic that Gary was talking about, and I do want your perspective on this, Tim. You talked about a huge sum of that money going to offshore investment. Two questions, both sort of related to this. One, is there a case for restricting the amount of super funds that is invested overseas versus the amount that's invested in Australia, for example, infrastructure. And just off the back of that, when you do invest, um, whether in social causes or even if we're talking about infrastructure, is there should there be a priority to local versus global? I'll start with Tim. Yeah, so um, firstly, just to say, uh, if that six trillion is used for the benefit of Australia and the world my grandchild's coming into. I'm going to get my son to call that child <laughs> ASI, ASI. That's a great, uh, a great hopeful uh, challenge. Um, look, it's got to be local and global. 
we uh, misunderstand even aid. And now defence and intelligence sources are saying to the government, you've cut the Australian aid budget far too much. Why? Because aid that invests in health and education in our region actually works really well for us in terms of trade. Mm. This notion that somehow it's got to be invested here and stuff people over there. And I tell you what, if I had a dollar for every Australian that said to me, uh, charity begins at home and their subtext and it ends at home. <laughs> uh, and let's just look after ourselves plays into this zeitgeist of what I call the retribalizing of the world, turning inwards, beggaring our neighbour, being nationalistic, which is self-defeating mm. in terms of our trade in the most growing region, Asia, and being a good neighbour. You know, we cut aid in Myanmar by 40%. Mm. So guess who's getting the business contracts, Chinese and British, because they didn't cut aid, and it's hurting us here. So it's got to be both. Uh, I don't know about a split, but it's not an either or. Yep. I've got two more audience questions and only three minutes on the clock, so I'm going to go to the audience. Yes? Hi. Um, so David Hartley. Kerry, we even um, brought together two things which he put in separate lines. One was infrastructure and the other one was affordable and social housing. Mm -hmm. Isn't there a scope to have um, those two things linked? In other words, have uh, treated like an infrastructure asset, lease land to developers or whomever, for them to create these properties and then provide long-term rental accommodation at reasonable prices with a cap rate of return. Great question, David. Yeah, I, 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 I absolutely think no reason why not. Um, the, 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 the essential thing, people invest in infrastructure, they, they, they tend to want to achieve equity-like returns with less volatility. That's essentially what they like to achieve. And, but within that, there's a fairly big range of, of target rates of return that will, will be tolerated. You know, different funds will tolerate, will, will target different parts of the market. Mm -hmm. um, but there's quite a large appetite for uh, quite modest returns, provided they are highly dependable returns, which gets back to this thing. I mean, there is few things more dependable than housing. Yeah. And, ab and, and social housing, absolutely, because yeah. there's no demand volatility. Yeah. And, uh, and so there's, there's no reason why structures and policy settings can't be brought to together so that people would be very happy to call large, very large-scale social housing, mm. um, aged care housing, dis disabled housing, affordable rental housing, mm. Part of an ad, uh, of an infrastructure portfolio. No, no reason at all why that shouldn't be the case. Yeah. But it's about creating that framework, as David was alluding to as well, to ensure that there is that correct return on investment as well. So, the, sorry, the link that the, the link that he was talking about is is to create that framework so that there is that mutual benefit not only to members but of course to the social yeah, projects there has, as well. There has to be the, there has to be some policy assistance. It it can't yeah. quite get there on its own at the moment. It yeah. Can't quite get there on its own. Okay, last question. Uh, Wally Troll here from uh, Buscu. On the question of fiduciary duty, uh, am I right in, in believing that what you're saying is there's, we, the last thing we want is more government intervention to phrase it, to stiffen it up. What we really need is a very broad public debate, mm. and that's very hard to do in this country with centralised media, mm. to, uh, to discuss what the objects of superannuation is. And should fund, for example, at some point in time, quantify, so we maybe say, well, we give you a 9% return, but we also give you a 2% do good works return as well, yeah. so that the punter can, uh, can evaluate it in yeah. that sort of format. Thank you. That's, that's a great, I didn't, didn't plan, didn't, you, people think I planned that, because it's a great question, <laughs> because it allows, it allows me to say this. If, when you, when you, if you go right back to the sort of very early days of our movement, the very last negotiation that I had before leaving the ACT at the end of the 80s was ironically with the Australian Chamber of Manufacturers, which is now part of Australian Industry Group, and, wait for it, AMP. And what we negotiated was a framework called Develop Australia Fund, Develop Australia Fund, and to look at infrastructure and similar investments. And the reason we did it was because Back in those days, as has ever been the case, politicians kept running around Canberra quacking about should we regulate super 
to direct it into this or that or some other pet favourite area. And what, what we agreed is that, well, if it's got merit, let's see if we can create the structures to do it. And what turned out to be the case is by going into an area that wasn't serviced, that was less researched, that was less liquid, therefore a premium for giving away the liquidity, a premium because you're going to less research, the returns have been stellar. The returns have been way ahead of the stock market with way less volatility. Hmm. So, uh, so I, 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 we, don't need, we don't need government to come in and regulate everything. We need creativity and leadership from all sectors to do the right thing by Australians long term and by the world. That's what we need. Tim Funnell. Yeah, I just say amen to that. <laughs> and on that, I'm going to wrap this session up. Thank you both so much for your time. Please put your hands together for Tim Costello and Gary Reaven. Now, the speaker gives both of you our donations to the First Nations Foundation. Uh, that's proudly supported by Holding Red Lick. But thank you again for thank your time. You. Uh, thank you again, everyone. You can remember, just a reminder, you can actually use your app to rate the session and provide any feedback as well. But now it's time for morning tea, and that will just take place outside in the main foyer. And that's proudly supported by event partner Lazard Asset Management. Thank you. Thank you.